story time a few weeks ago. I was invited to a dinner party with a bunch of people from 20 to 40 years old, I'd say, lower to middle class, not really into politics. And at some point, one of them said that he tries his best not to describe someone or refer to someone by their race, especially when he was with his kid. So in that specific case, he refused to describe a black person using the adjective black and used a bunch of other attributes of that person, his size, his age, his looks, to get the other person to understand who he was referring to. He refused to use the adjective black because he felt it would be offensive, reductive, to describe someone through their skin color. And that is very French to me. And to be fair, I used to do the same thing when I was younger. I also thought that identifying someone by their skin color was reductive and I would also have used other attributes to avoid saying the dirty word that they're black. Quite literally, actually, because it is quite common in France to say un black, so a black person, instead of the exact translation un noir. The use of the English term black makes it less heavy, whereas noir sounds suspicious, too racially connoted, almost racist. This is exactly why I titled this video Race Does Not Exist in France. At least, that's what a lot of French people say. And to be fair, they are not completely wrong, in a way, because we don't have many tools to measure racism, xenophobia, discrimination, because we cannot collect statistics based on ethnicity. The term race itself is quite controversial. French people hate to use it because it implies that race exists, and they'd rather believe it doesn't. In the past decade, French left-wing politicians, social activists, social scientists, and younger generations in general have reintroduced this notion of race in public discourse, and many aren't happy with it. Critics have talked about the Americanization of France, the threat of wokeism, racialism, which refers to people who, quote, see race everywhere. That sort of criticism largely comes from French right-wingers, but also from a portion of the left that believes that no, we shouldn't talk about race, because the more we talk about it, the more people see it. The reality is that we all see it. It'd be hypocritical to say that we live in a post-racial society. Sure, we don't have many tools to measure it, but racism still exists. 91% of French black people say that they have been the victim of discrimination at least once in their lives. And no, 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 you can't say that 91% of them are lying or overreacting. Racism is there, we have to talk about it in schools, in universities, on TV, in parliament. So yes, younger generations are more open to use terms like race, racism, Islamophobia. As a result, we see those terms appear more and more often on mainstream media, which gives the illusion that those issues are uh, more present than they used to be. Which makes a lot of people question why do people feel the need to talk about them more. Those who claim to be anti-work explain that the younger generations tend to overreact to any slight occurrence of racism, that they have become too sensitive, that they prioritize their racial identity over everything. This is what these two men said on a popular French TV show to Maboula Soumaoro, whose work as a scholar focuses on black history and diaspora. Soumaoro replied that it is convenient to look at anecdotes of young black people being angry or, quote, oversensitive, and use it to shut down any discussions on racism. Instead, she argues that taking into account France's history with racism allows us to look at these oversensitive black people not as snowflakes, but as the products and victims of systemic discrimination, including physical violence, police brutality, disfranchisement, unemployment discrimination, discrimination in terms of housing, etc. etc. She says, we pretend that racism doesn't exist, as if the history of racism started in 2010 with work people who are obsessed about race, but we have to respect history, the history of our modern societies. When we talk about the orthodoxy of American campuses, we talk about departments that were created in the 1960s, 70s. That doesn't mean that people didn't think about those things in the past, but that those people weren't represented in universities. Because if you were a woman, you weren't hired in universities. If you were a minority, you weren't hired in universities. Sociologist Eric Vassin added that, yes, it is true that there are people in France who are very sensitive to minority issues. Many people are concerned about equality and liberty. Just a little parenthesis here, I just want to remind you that the French Republic slogan is liberty, equality, fraternity. He said that when we talk about gender, when we talk about race, we talk about power relationships. So that means we talk about inequalities, about discriminating people by putting them in boxes. 
However, discussions on gender and race are detached from the notions of equality and liberty and relegated to the realm of identity politics. But doing so helps frame the works as anti-republican when in fact they are the ones who care about the republican values of equality and liberty. There is a real paradox here, because when we talk about fighting against inequalities, fighting against discrimination, we are told that we put the French Republic at the risk of disappearing. So my question is very simple. What is the French Republic, really? In order to answer that question, we have to look at how the French Republic was forged, which means we're gonna have to talk about French colonial history. France established its colonies in India, Africa, in North America, a few islands here and there, including the West Indies from the 16th century. It then lost some colonies in North America, but strengthened its presence in Africa, Asia, Oceania, which includes French Polynesia, New Caledonia, and the New Hebrides but also South America with Guyana. Today, France still has a few colonies here and there across the globe, and it has also kept close relationships with former colonies like Algeria and African countries. For a long time, French diplomats described France's relationship with Africa as France-Afrique. The expression is no longer used because of its neo-colonial connotation. France-Afrique was largely based on the promotion of French culture and language abroad. It sought to continue to maintain economic and political exchanges in favour of France in exchange of military defence, which too often took the form of interference. Macron recently ended the France-Afrique era to open a new, neutral relationship with Africa. It is not surprising in a way, because in the past few years, anti-France sentiments have grown among young Amer not Americans, young Africans living in former French colonies, mainly through social media. Here's a video I wanted to show you that my research assistant, aka my sister, I don't explode her, don't worry. Here's a video she found, uh, which is both really funny and also quite serious. In it, Moazulu Diabamba Siwalamba tells us about the history of the artworks present in Kebrandi, which is a museum specialized in African art. And then, after all these explanations, he just takes the art, because it was stolen from his ancestors, and then walks towards the exit of the museum. The video circulated a lot, obviously, it sparked discussions on the restitution of the 90% du patrimoine culturel africain se trouve aujourd'hui en Europe. Yes, yes, she's just said that 90% of Africa's cultural heritage is currently in Europe. And we don't really talk about it. If France was a person, I think it would be the avoidant type, you know, the one that does not want to confront big problems, who put things under the carpet and hopes people will forget. As an example, most former European colonial powers have done the work. I'm not saying that they are perfect, don't get me wrong, but in the UK, in Germany, you find museums that talk about their colonial past. As someone once joked on TV, France has 23 museums on clogs, clogs, yes, <laughs> but none on colonialism. We refuse to say that we went to war in Algeria, in Cameroon, the same way a toxic ex refuses to recognize they hurt you, but you know they did. I want to talk a bit more about Algeria. The war against France occupation started in 1954. It was triggered by the FLN, the National Liberation Front, in opposition to the French army, which also included a portion of Algerians called les Arquis. After many massacres, many deaths, the war ended in 1962 after 90% of French people voted for the independence of Algeria. Progressively, French troops left the country. It was a new beginning. On the other hand, the Arqui, so Algerians who sided with the French during the war, were no longer welcome in their home country and were treated like subhuman in France, despite their support during the war. This is another example where we only starting to talk about those things. Because the children of those who were colonized and then moved to France are starting to tell the stories that their parents were told to keep for themselves. Those children are progressively accessing positions where their voices can be heard in academia, in journalism, in politics, etc. But those stories have always existed. In fact, they were telling those stories, but no one was willing to listen to them. You may be familiar with Omar Sy, he played Lupin in the Netflix TV series of the same name. He's a very well-known French actor, French people love him, he always end up on the list of French people's favorite celebrities. Until... The war in Ukraine wasn't a groundbreaking revelation for me. I have family in Africa, I know there have always been children living in the war. Broken families, parents who lose their children, children who become orphans. It has never stopped since the Second World War. I'm surprised that people are so affected by it here. Does that mean it does not affect you as much when it happens in Africa? That, that was taken as an insult. Omar Sy was said to be ungrateful, to have forgotten what France did for him. 
The message was very clear. Without France, Omar Sy would be nothing. The subtext was also very clear. Omar Sy was not considered as a French person, literally born in France, as French as me. France is something outside of him. France gave him success. That is racist. The Instagram page Décolonise en nous shared this meme which summed up the situation very well. Not being white in France means that you constantly have to prove that you are French, that you love your country, that you're a f***ing baguette and croissant addict. Say you love baguette, le mal, say it. I mean, this is ridiculous to be honest. How can we deny literal history to that degree? I don't owe anything to anybody. I am French. As you can see, younger generations are forcing France to finally go to therapy and work on that avoidant nature because we won't be able to heal all the trauma caused by colonization if we don't accelerate the process. I'll stop with the therapy metaphor, you get the point. In fact, the use is becoming less and less patient, less and less tolerant, because we see that the fight against racism, xenophobia, faces a serious backlash coming from the far right. I mean, far right activists recently burned the house and the cars of a mayor who had planned on opening a center for asylum seekers. This is really serious. They are also becoming less tolerant because they saw how their parents try their best to integrate, to assimilate, to be more precise, into French culture, but still face many forms of discrimination, employment, housing, aggressions, hate speech, etc. So yes, now they say out loud that they are proud to be black, to be Muslim, to have complex identities that they want to preserve. Be you. Be, be proud of you because you can be, do what we want to do. They want to tell their stories and promote the stories of those who came before them. I mean, while I was doing the research for this video, I discovered the stories of impressive women, ultra girl bosses, like Lala Fatma and Sumer, nicknamed Giorgio Raz Joan of Arc, who resisted against France's colonial invasion in Algeria in the 19th century. But I also learned about the story of female warriors of Dahomey in Benin who also fought against French colonization. They looked super intimidating and were known to be powerful warriors. They were called the Minos, which means our mother, and protected the king. These are stories that we've never heard about because nobody was willing to listen. And to be fair, more French people are still not willing to listen. You know, it was in 2007 that President Nicolas Sarkozy managed to say in front of an audience, partly made of black people, if not entirely, that the African men did not sufficiently make history. Nevertheless, all those testimonies, those stories, point towards one goal, re-establishing the truth and justice. And that is something scholar Sheikh on Tadjop already said in the 1960s, 1970s, when he asked his student to stop being obsessed with getting white people to approve black scholars' work, to stop believing that, quote, truth sounds white. He recommended instead to forge an African identity, intelligentsia, to create new frameworks. And it's funny in a way because he ended up doing what he'd advised not to do. I don't know if you know this, but Job is one of the leading scholars behind Afrocentrism, which is based on the belief in Black Egypt. Maybe you've heard about it recently with the drama around Netflix Cleopatra's documentary. It's a controversial topic because it is quite political. Um, but by claiming that Egypt was black, which goes against what most experts have shown, it is said that advocates of Afrocentrism did exactly what white people did with ethnocentrism. First, they sort of created this unique identity, Africa, the same way we created this sort of unique identity as white Europeans, you know, which ultimately erases diverse cultures, etc. They also sought, like Europeans, to promote that they were at the origin of civilization to legitimize their power, their superiority over other cultures and ethnicities, instead of promoting their own cultures and their diversity. But doing that instead is very difficult, isn't it? It's tempting to people-please the ones you've been taught to look up to, to be the good black person that makes it to French people's favorite celebrities list, to be grateful, to not talk about your race because that'd be too political. I wanted to make this video because it's been requested many times, but also because it is possible that racism and xenophobia get worst as the far right becomes more and more popular and also as we start to see population migrating to the north and eventually to Europe because of climate change. I mean we French people won't be able to say that race racism does not exist when the far right will choose to close our borders. So we have to continue to raise awareness, to open people's eyes to the reality that is in front of us and do the best job we can to avoid a worst case scenario. And obviously this is not limited to France, you know. But yeah, making this video was really interesting because I realized that I didn't know enough. I 
actually don't know much about all that history. So if you want to learn more, and I highly, highly recommend you educate yourself more on those topics, I'll put some resources down there. Um, and yeah, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a bit more informative than what I usually do. But yeah, it's always good to be mindful of our history, to again be more aware of our position in the world and how it affects other people. Before I end the video, I need to introduce you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. You can create your own website around your preferred aesthetic from a catalog of templates and use it as a landing platform for all the activity you do. YouTube, online shop, blog, podcast, photography, etc. Once that is set up, you can connect all your social media accounts and share content between different platforms. Squarespace can also help you create effective email campaigns to really connect with your community. Finally, they have this very cool feature where you can connect and learn from other creators like Adrien Raquel, who will show you how you can best use the platform. If you feel like Squarespace is made for you and you want to check it out, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you've experimented and you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring the video. Before I end, I need to say thank you to my patrons and a special thank to top tier patrons Trebizond, Toki, Corrigi, Tristan, Patricia, Marcelo, Christopher, Ian, Donage, Ren, Alex, Sam, Manuel, Dakota, Jay, Benjamin, Perry, and Carla. Other than that, I'll see you very soon. And yeah, salut!